Hey family, thank you for tuning in to Our Roots Podcast with Joseph Babaifa. We're only the strongest roots see the light, brought to you by Botanica Candles and more. And if you haven't had the opportunity, please hit that subscribe button and tap on that like button. Very great topic today, one that's going to make me very emotional and one we've been wanting to come out with for a long time. Ifa and fertility, right? And the guest today needs no introduction. She's my soulmate, my twin flame, my life partner, Miss Erica Boroye. Thank you. It's it's a pleasure to be back on, especially to to talk about something that really hits home and um, hopefully help and give hope uh, to some viewers out there that are maybe struggling with infertility. I think that's going to be the central word um, for this interview is hope, right? Because you don't realize how important hope is until it's all you have, right? Um, Ifa's views on fertility are very emphatic. I mean, when we're talking about the whole basis of the religion is procreation. And the whole basis of evil is to interrupt it. The human race is an interesting creature or set of creatures because we are literally, literally the enemies of nature, right? We come, we destroy, we utilize... Um, but Olo Dumare saw fit by way of making us in his image that we still deserve a chance at happiness, a chance at growth, a chance at creating something. And he ultimately made us God by way of, you know, uniting as man and woman and procreating, right? Naturally. Um, so that's really Fa's views. And it goes all the way back to the first sign, which is the Odu of Eyobe, or even your sign, which is of Obetumako, where children first started coming down, um, from heaven and being received by mothers and the nurturing process and the role of man and woman as parents. You know, as you learned, um, before we get into our story, as you learned about your sign and the ramifications it had with maternity, how much sense did it make to you based on your personality as a mom? Well, it, it made a lot of sense because I always say um, I was born to be a mom. Like it is the most important title, job, accomplishment, that I will ever achieve in my life. And um, when my sign was manifested, I actually found it to be very interesting because I said, well, this does make sense because I actually have always been a very fertile woman. Um, being that by the time I received, I did have two children and then soon after had a third. Um, so it was interesting to see that maternal aspect um, within my sign, but then to really live the opposite aspect of it was interesting because you know some people would say that you know based on my sign it, it it does talk about fertility struggle and you know when when I read that I said well I've never struggled with that and it's interesting how a sign can manifest over time you know where you may at the moment you know say well this doesn't apply to me and then all of a sudden it does so that was the interesting part of it. Rumila has 2020 forward, backwards, and side to side. He sees things that we can never imagine. He foresees people that we never think we're actually going to interact with, which really resonates with our story because we really weren't on each other's radar. Um, I want to go all the way back to our first encounter. I'll never forget um, when I walked into the Botanica wearing those sparkling white clothes and um, I said hello to the people that we know in common. And um, they were like, hey, this is Erica. And I said, okay. And in my mind, I'm like, okay, she's interesting. Let me put my hand out there so I don't look like an idiot. And when I put my hand out there, you reciprocated, but it was a very limp handshake. And at that moment, I said, I don't like her. You know, yeah. What was going through your mind? I think the feelings were mutual <laughs> because when I walked in first, first and foremost, I was really stressed out that day because we were actually getting ready to perform an Orisha ceremony initiation Correct. and that I was going to work as the right hand. And we just had a lot going on. So when I walked into the Botanica, I see you there in white. And I want to say you were a yawo. We might have been. Yeah, you about... were a yawo at that time. And I'm looking at you like, what is this guy? First of all, what is this guy doing in here? And then you gave me your hand. Excuse me. You didn't salute me or anything the way you were supposed to, yawo. So I'm like, he's not even supposed to be giving me his hand. But, you know, I, I shook it because, you know, you're. You, you know, allowed me to but shake then, yours. But then I kind of was like. 
you know, I was, I was, there was a resistance there, yeah. but you know, ultimately I did notice your looks though. You oh. know, you were looking pretty good in the whites. Oh Lord. You know, but I had to give you character. I just, I had to show yeah, it to you. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta set up the wall because men are the enemy, you know? Um, but I tell you the the feelings were mutual and it was really incredible because I've always said the best relationships begin when there is that caution, you know, when we don't jump into things, when we get to know each other and whatnot. And um, it left so much of an impression on me. And I wasn't a bad yawo, by the way, before we move on. I, was I knew you were going to comment on that. I was very good. I just, you know, I had, I was, I was in the mix. You just you know got caught saying? off guard. I got caught off guard completely because I exactly. said, I just want to come in contact with her. Right. So needless to say, we, we part ways. Right. Never thought I was going to see you again. Maybe you felt the same. Um, and then we run into each other again in Miami. Right. We were at, um, at least I was um, working some ifa ceremonies for the people we knew in common. And I was actually there for the week. So I was pretty much seeing everything that was going on. And then guess who walks in? Miss Erica with, uh, with my two sons now. And um, needless to say, you were interesting once again. I don't even think we said hello to each other. I really don't remember. I think maybe. I'm not sure. But it was very brief. You know, it wasn't as, as cold as the first time. But, you know, it's like, okay, second time. Um, you were doing your thing. The boys were getting their ebo done. I worked that ebo. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I sat with the boys and uh, and we played Pokemon Go for like an hour in the interim. And I'll never forget. There was like this moment when I'm sitting with these kids, and I said, I don't know why, but I feel like I'm gonna be a part of these people's lives. You know, and I, I can't explain it. I don't know. Maybe I was thirsty. I don't know what it was, but I just I looked at these boys and you know i looked at you and i said there's there's a light about you you know um and you've expressed you kind of noticed me once again you know as you were going through that process yeah definitely um when i saw you that second time you actually at that point were a babalao yeah you yeah. were initiated and um i don't know at, at that it was just a different time in my life as well um a lot of transitions rather, yeah there was a lot of transitions that had occurred by then so i was more open um, to maybe seeing you in a different light. And I did that day. I actually, you know, you felt very familiar. That's the best way I could describe it. You know, it's that feeling like, you know, I feel like I've been with this person before or I don't know, I've met them before. And I, I just remember that I was very intrigued by you and also the way you carried yourself and, you know, just the way you were and how smart you were. I appreciate that, you know, I really do. Um, I didn't get a chance to gauge at least as much as I wanted because you've always had this character of a, you know, reservation. And I think it's one of the things that most attracted me to you. And most, I think the most important thing, what leads to love is respect. And immediately I saw that with you, you were a woman of respect and those were the kind of women that raised me. So immediately I found it interesting, a little bit challenging, but you know, I'm, I'm up for that. And um, once again, we part, we part ways to never see each other again, possibly. We, we knew people in common, but you know, it was kind of star crossed. And before we delve into other aspects, I want to mention one other encounter that we had. And I think this gentleman um, is single-handedly the great matchmaker of our life, our love. Your father, you know what I'm saying? Robert Montañez, Awo Irete Gutang, Faoma, NYPD veteran, hero, 9-11, etc., decorated. I'll never forget, we met at his, uh, his onras that they were doing, right? And um, once again, I didn't know. Even who the gentleman was, you know, I saw you there again. I said, okay, so this person was related to this person. And I basically went about my job, you know, doing what I could. Um, the, the humility and the manners that you've always seen in me were how I always interacted. And I, I was so happy that you got to see that naturally within me rather than just seeing it through a courting process, you know? And once again, you were very reserved. I never knew you even noticed me other than a handshake and a goodbye. I think I got a chance to say goodbye that time, you know? But what was it like on your end, you know? I, you know, that was another experience because we were going through such a hard time and a transition with such a great loss of, oh, yeah. you know, Patriarch. the head of a <clears throat> family. And I really just recall appreciating your conduct, yeah. appreciating your good character and the way that you were um, just very considerate and you were very gentle. And it was, it was, I'm not going in on, you know, maybe other babalaos that are out there, but it was very different to me and very interesting the way you conducted yourself. 
Yeah. And um, it, it really attracted me. So it was something that stuck with me. And I really appreciated it. Well, one thing I realized immediately when they would talk about your dad, seeing the way you guys were emotionally responding to the process, I said, this man was very loved. I said, um, you know, less is more here, you know, and um, do your job, you know, don't be a bad memory and get out, you know. And I, I, I really reflect upon a lot of the, uh, the training that my godfather gave me as far as conduct because he really showed me how to maneuver um, in any context within the spirituality you know so i'm happy you got to see that aspect even before um we began interacting after all these encounters you know as fate would have it ultimately um we interact once again right and by this way it was by way of your mother you know miss nelly and um she was originally my client you yeah. know and um i'm like oh my god this woman's in my house you know and what's going on with me? I have 103 grade fever. Yeah, you had the flu that day. I had the flu. I just came back from a crazy trip to Miami. You know, like, yeah, I didn't even know what I was doing. But I was like, I can't cancel on this woman because I might end up seeing her. You know what I'm saying? So with phlegm and everything that comes with it, there I was on the mat. And you got to see all 103 degrees of flavor. You know? And when I saw the air ball, it was history. Yeah. I said, man, this is the one. This is the one. It was the honey. It was the honey. You know, and um, from there, I think we became friends. Yeah. Um, I was privileged enough to actually perform the ceremony for your father over a year process that's done when the Babalawo unfortunately transitions without a Kwanadu. And for all those brothers out there, please receive Cuchillo so you're not in limbo for that time. Yeah. Um, because you see how it affects a family and you see the benefits that come once we finish, right? And with time and with respect, we became friends. Um, you know, where we weren't once again, even on each other's radar in that regard, maybe there were feelings now that we, you know, have been able to sit down as man and woman, we've been able to talk about how we were feeling about each other. But I think the most beautiful thing is the elegance that was between us. And we allowed a friendship to grow, to grow. And I'll yes. never forget that one night. I'll never forget that one night. I, I, I was looking at you. I think we were passing each other on the patio and I looked at you and I told you, I loved you Yeah. in the most respectful way. I thought at that time, but I didn't realize until I said it, all of the connotations that I was really saying. And I actually got a little embarrassed because I said, oh, my Lord, she's never going to let me inside again. Um, what did you feel when I said that to you? You know, I, I mean, honestly, at, at that moment, I just was like, wow, this guy is so loving. Like, you know, because you were just very like just a very loving guy and i was like you know i didn't realize at the moment i didn't receive it that way i, I yeah. just felt like you know it was the love of of a friendship yeah but i think that it was the most amazing way for us to start is through a genuine friendship where there were no motives other than we really liked each other and we really got along with each other as friends yeah we i noticed that we were cool and we would we would be the only ones laughing at each other's jokes and even to this day like amelia will be like man you guys are made for each other yeah you guys are the only ones that get each other's humor we get that a lot yeah you know what i'm saying and um you know time progresses and then i think you know the the fateful night the day before our anniversary now um you invite me to your mother's birthday party and uh you know i said i have to go to this birthday party you know, and um, I went after work, you know, ironically, I started work the same day I started your dad's stuff and months went by. Um, this was in August and I show up, I, I, I mingle with a couple people. The boys recognized me, so it wasn't too awkward. I think I was talking to your brother for like a half hour before you got there and then you guys arrived and I will never forget what you were wearing. Your hair was blonde. You had the, uh, the poison ivy green dress on with the red lipstick, you know, had the heels on and i said good lord man how am i gonna survive tonight you know what i'm saying you almost didn't i almost didn't i almost didn't you know and uh yeah we were spying on each other from across the room somehow we met up in the dance floor and i'll never forget um hands on each other's backs i said how long have you been wanting to scratch my back exactly and that's yeah it was it was all what'd you say history <clears throat> um i said wow for a while for a while now it was over with. It was over. So you with. have good game. I was. It's 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 all focused <laughs> on you now. Like yo, you shoot the free throw, make it. You know. But it was it was real, and um, you know, at that point, yeah, it was on. Um, I tell you, you know, as we grew, as we got to know each other, um, as I got to really delve into your life, I'll never forget those conversations where we would have where 
sometimes we'd have the house all to ourselves and you'd be like, yo, this, this isn't my life. You know what I'm saying? I got kids, I have responsibilities, you know? And, um, I remember taking that very seriously. I remember looking at you and after a very, um, influential conversation, even with my father, you know, understanding the responsibility of um, loving a woman and, and becoming a stepfather, which is even besides being a father, one of the most gratifying things I've ever done, you know, understanding this is real now, you know, you have a family now, you know? Um, but then we had that faithful conversation as well, where you, where you expressed some things to me that I wasn't aware of, you know, as far as uh, creating something, you know? Yeah. So I, I, I thought it would be <coughs> fair. And, you know, being that, we don't have to disclose ages, but I'm a little bit older than you. It's not a lot, a but, flick. you know, it's not it's not quite 10 years older. So we'll leave it there. But, you know, you being that you were younger, you know, it was the first thing that I made sure I wanted to mention to you because I thought it was only fair um, to mention that I actually had my tubes tied. Yeah. After my third child, my yeah. third beautiful bouncing baby girl. The one that's over there. And, <laughs> um... We had that conversation and we actually had it immediately when Very we decided quickly. we were going to become a thing, an item. Um, and so you were very open to it, actually. You were, you know, you were just like, hey, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. But I wanted to be honest with you because I wanted to make sure that you were making informed decisions. Yeah. So. And um, I was actually, you know, even taken aback by myself because. As a 25-year-old man, um, I hadn't created any children at that point. Um, I don't know. I, don't, I didn't fear my response either. I didn't find any lack of ingenuity in it or genuineness in it. I had this calm where I was like, everything will be fine. I even told you, don't, I'm, don't worry about that. I don't know why I said that because I didn't understand the type of tube ligation. I didn't understand anything about your background. But you understood it was permanent. I understood it mm -hmm. was permanent. I literally, and I'm looking at myself, I said, you know, I'm someone that's always wanted to create a child, you know, but at the same time, I'm so infatuated with this woman, her concepts, um, everything about her. I don't care, you know, and, and I, I just moved forward. And at that point, we grew in love. We grew in relationship. We grew in struggle together. I mean, when we met each other, we definitely weren't in the conditions we're in now. Oh, no. I, I was having my water, my electricity cut off. Yeah. I remember that day where you were. I was supposed to come over. And you were like, don't come over. I said, I bought food already. You know, don't come over. Um, and I showed up because I thought you were being held hostage. Or I thought, good God, you know, I mean, maybe a crazy ex. I said, I don't know what's going on. Um, and then you revealed that to me. And I remember that night... Um, I came to a conclusion, you will never need or want for anything or any of my children, right? And then the grind began. You know, when you met me, I was in my grandmother's back room. When I met you, you were transitioning into a call center position, you know, things like that. And, um, you know, as a man, especially someone delving into their later 20s, coming up to their early 30s, money is a very predominant thing on the mind because by nature, all we want to do is provide. That's all we want to do. So when I'm looking at my condition, I'm making a little more money at that point at AT&T than I was beforehand. You know, I'm working, but I said, this isn't enough, you know? So the grind continued. And I'll never forget that year I saw myself with the Odio Baracosum. And, you know, you were someone that would, you know, because the male clock and the female clock, we were at different stages of life, technically from a time standpoint. So every now and again, you'd bring it up. Hey, a baby. I'm like, yeah. In time, I mean, because in my mind, I'm like, I can't afford us. You know what I'm saying? And um, you were always very confident in that, that, you know, the time was getting closer. And I remember there was a moment where it's like, okay, we need to come to a determination. Are we going to start trying this year? And I came with the Odu o Baracosum, which I'll never forget. There's a verse that speaks of when money and children were battling to see who was going to come down from heaven first, right? And um, children went down first. And being that there was no money or conditions, they died. And they went back to heaven, told their story, and then money went down first. Where the conditions were prepared and the child was able to come down peacefully and not know what hunger was, not know what stress was. And at that moment, based on my interpretation, and this is why I believe in Ifa so much, apart from all the other things we're going to mention here that are so divine, you know, mm -hmm. and so epic, I said, we need to wait one more year. 
What went through your mind when I said that? I was concerned, you know, um, because like I said earlier, fertility was never a problem for me, but I did realize that my biological clock was, was really ticking, you know, and I was getting up to that 35 year mark and I was like starting to get concerned. So, but at the same time, you know, I, I, I understood I, I understood and, and I have faith in what the Orishas were advising us at that time. And and that was that's the part where, you know, sometimes what we want is not necessarily what we're what we, we need to do. And so that's that's where the faith comes in and listening and, and the obedience comes in so that you could have positive outcomes. The trust. And, and that's what we did. Yeah. We followed that. The trust we had in each other and the trust we ultimately had in the Oracle, because even myself at that moment, regardless of the funds we had, I said, good Lord, another year. But when I came with that Odu, I said, I can't interpret it any other way. And I forgot the one you uh, you came with that year, but, you know, that Obarakosum gave a very definite answer on that. And, you know, once again, Odumila proved and prevailed because yes. that year, you know, we opened the Botanica. Yes. That year, the Botanica started providing, you know, and at that point. And we had no idea the financial, you know, strain that oh, was going to come with some real you know, estate deals came through. Yeah, with you know. with the wanting to conceive, so everything did make sense once we started living it out. Yeah, and I remember once we got to that level of stability, which was coming also after me receiving cuchillo and whatnot, um, we revisited the conversation, and I'll never forget. You asked me, and at that moment, you know, I was able to actually look and be like, "Yeah, let's go." You know, but the crazy thing is just the timing because you get so scared because you look at time, the ticking, the seconds, like, you know, every every moment that goes by is fleeting, you know. So at that moment, even when we started, I said, good Lord, you know, what's to come um, before we continue? I'd really love it if you got into the dream you had with your dad, because I remember you had yes. expressed it to me around that time as well. So if you want to delve into that before we go into another half. Yeah. So um my father passed in 2014, yeah. and exactly a year um, of his passing, which was his anniversary, you know, I, at that point I was already initiated. So, you know, I was working with my altar, and I was doing some invocations and, you know, paying homage to his spirit. And that night I asked him to visit me because I had missed him so much, and, you know, I, I wanted some confirmations that he was okay and it's interesting because even being a spiritualist, being a medium, when you lose somebody like that, there is still an aspect and, and a, a bit of doubt. Like, you know, where does this person go? You know, what, what yeah. you know, it's, 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 it's almost like it's, it's shocking to anyone. So that night, sure enough, um, I had a visitation and it was very vivid. Um, I was in an event, in a party. And when I looked across the room, I saw him. And he took me outside the party. And he actually took me across a bridge. So I want to interpret that he took me to the other side. Yeah, very symbolic. He kept me at the edge of that bridge, though. There was a point that I couldn't go further. Yeah. So we were literally, like, at the foot of a bridge. And we had a full conversation. And I asked him all the questions that I had. Um, and he answered them. But without getting into too much detail about that conversation... Uh, on the part that relates to our story was that he looked at me and he said, you're going to have more children and I'm here with them. I've met them on the other side. And um, I just, when I woke up from that visitation, I wrote everything down. Um, and at that time I was in the process of a separation and I knew that my tubes were tied. So that part of his communication with me, I was like trying to understand it or be able to interpret it um, because I'm like, why would he say I'm going to have more children? You know, but it was so specific. Like he made it a point to say, and he said, they're going to make you very happy. Um, and, you know, letting me know that he, he was with them and that, you know, that for me to know when they do come, a part of him was going to come as well. And, um, yeah, that was that was the visit that I had with him so many years ago, many years before I even met you. Yeah. So it was just crazy how life just makes a full circle and how things start unraveling. 
the dynamic and it really just builds that faith more because you can't write this, you know, you can't create this. This is a divine tapestry, you know, of what destiny is. And I remember that year when we did the divination, when we were going to actually start working towards, you know, um, the options that we had, I came with a favorable Odu, it seemed, and you did as well. I came with Ayobe and you came with Obeche, you know, so it spoke a lot about Ochun, her maternity, Ayobe, was yeah. the first guy to the first OBGYN, the first guy to deliver a baby, you know, so we were very hyped. Um, you know, but it's interesting because this will make a, a full circle later on. When we were looking into our options, I'll never forget, I asked you, I said, E, and there's no way to reverse the tubes. And what did you tell me? I said that I had already looked into it yeah. and um, they couldn't find my records because it was already a certain amount of years that had passed before my. So I had my surgery in 2012 when I had my daughter. A very Allie. crucial year, apparently. In, yeah, in and so it actually they shifted the way they, uh, a lot of hospitals were shifting the methods yeah. of the way they were doing a tying tubes or whatever you want to call them, right? Yeah. But I thought my tubes were burnt because, you know, always when you think about, you know, I didn't ask any questions really, which, you know, I don't recommend at this point for anybody to do understand the procedures that are being done and always get your operative report because yeah. you never know when you're going to need it. Yeah. But I, honestly, I just thought my tubes were completely burnt off. I had no idea. So you're smelling so many things in the I actually room. thought I smelt them burning it, you know, during my process because I was awake. It was during a C-section yeah. delivery. So I'm like, I'm hearing, I'm smelling something burning. I don't yeah. know. I'm thinking, oh, they're burning my tubes. So, yeah. um, but I actually did try to get my records and they couldn't find my records at that time. Yeah. So based on that, um, we have our first initial um, IVF, you know, consultation with said physician. And, um, you know, when we get to that point, you know, he went over a couple key points. Um, but he asked about your status with the tube ligation, fertility, et cetera. He asked about the year, you know, and we answered him very, you know, frankly. And he said, well, that, you know removes said option all that's left is IVF right based on the information that was provided to him that we had at the moment right so this is how we're moving forward right and you know simultaneously while we're working towards this monumental goal um, a very important person in my life started faltering right my grandmother you know and as um, she starts um, nearing her transition the degeneration of her various conditions you know I'll never forget the morning that she actually passed away um, was our initial visit, you know, as far as like testing, because they had to see where my levels were at, et cetera. And um, I'll never forget, I slept by my grandmother's side that night. You were on the bed next to her and um, I was holding her hand and the whole night, eight hours just there, you know, I, I've never, I never realized how firm this woman's grip was until she was hanging on to the last bit of life that she had. And I remember that morning, um, the alarm that I had on the phone for said situation, obviously not thinking that was going to be the day she transitioned, goes off. And I see the letters IVF, you know. And I remember I looked at you um, and I said, what are we going to do? And you looked at me and she said, we might have to reschedule. And I don't know what it was. I, I can't explain any of these feelings or these intuitions. And I have to think that they were right looking back on the results now. But in that moment, the amount of doubt you have in yourself um, is monumental. And I, uh, I looked at you and I said, we have to go, you know. And um, you actually tried to dissuade me, you know, having lost someone as important as your father to you. And um, knowing how much my grandmother meant to me, you know, her being my father to a certain degree. Um, you know, but I persisted and you supported me and we left, right? Um, the hardest thing I've ever had to do is let go of my grandmother's hand at that moment, you know, but I knew that she, even though she wasn't going to get a chance to see her great grandchild, she wouldn't have wanted anything, not even her to interrupt that process. Right. So we went with the greatest of stresses. I got through the examinations and unfortunately when we left on um, our way back, um, to Point Siena. Um, we got the call that she had passed away, right? Um, needless to say, best things happening and worst things happening at the same time. Um, and, you know, as we went through that healing process, and now we have a whole different set of preoccupations now, because um, now with IVF, you 
are basically being a test subject. You know, they're taking blood, they're looking at levels. Um, you know, let's go over the results from that first blood test where they were talking about the AMH and things like that, you know. Okay. So, um, initially when we had our first consultation, the doctor, you know, was very optimistic. You know, he says, oh, this is like textbook, you know, you, you're still young. I, I mean, at that time I might've been, I want to say I was 36 when we started. Mm -hmm. Um, and he said, you know, this is nothing. This, you know, this is not going to be an issue. This is going to be a breeze. Yeah. You know, you've proven that you're fertile. You have three children. You're healthy. You're still young. I mean, because the average age of an IVF client, they're normally well in their Over 40s. 40s. Yeah, you have women having babies. And I'm 50 here now. 36. So he's like, this is a breeze. So, yeah. you know, and that's what I always felt. I, I always, you know, I took it for granted because I thought that as soon as we start, you know, we were just going to get yeah, lucky and, yeah, yeah. you know, move on with life. Yeah. And that's really not what happened. And so when we ended up having that first appointment, I actually had a dream the night before that we were going to get bad news. I don't know if you remember that. And then yeah, you were telling me, don't be I negative. Do. Yeah. But I said, no, but I had a dream that, you know, they said it's not going to work. And then when we went in, sure enough, the doctor was very, you know, he wasn't happy that day. He came in very serious. Yeah. And he did let me know that um, essentially based on the testing that I was considered to be infertile and that more than likely we were not going to be successful. You know, I have very low levels to the point where based on their um, their uh, criteria, yeah. um, it, it was it wasn't going to happen. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I must admit, I was pretty oblivious to what was occurring. Um, maybe it was just the shock. Maybe it was just the letdown. Um, but my whole focus was just coming up with the funds to be able to, you know, as a team, be able to take this step and accomplish this. So I, I can't say it was fake optimism because, you know, and I'll even ref reference mom here. Mom had this thing when I was younger where, hey, everything's going to be okay. Hey, this, hey, that. And I would look at her and I'd be like, you know, there's really nothing okay here. But somehow or another, things would turn out all right. And I'd kind of look at her and be like, what, what do you have going on? Maybe it was the secret in action. I don't know, manifesting things. But for some reason, even though we got that bad news, and we got quite a few bits of bad news even after this, I don't know why, but I just wasn't worried. And it wasn't because I didn't want to have a kid. It wasn't because I wasn't worried at the prospects of not having a kid you know what I'm saying, and never experiencing that, I don't know where those affirmations came from. And looking back now, I have to believe it was Egun. I have to believe it was spirit because there's no reason for me to be calm there, you know, and I'm not, I'm not a Navy SEAL. I don't have veins of ice, you know, I feel. Um, but for some reason, I just, it didn't matter, you know. So we move forward because we really didn't have any other options. Um, we were blessed enough financially to have a couple of things manifest where we were able to move forward. Um, you know, how was that first, uh, egg retrieval? So, um, so first and foremost, because we got that bad news, we, we definitely decided to go with a double, um, cycle, a double cycle, mm -hmm. right? Just in case the first one didn't go through. Cause we weren't willing to take no for an answer at that point. You know, we appreciated his honesty, but he also, the doctor, was just being honest with our expectations, but he had a plan as well. It of wasn't course. like he was saying we can't do it. He was saying, well, we can do it, but it may this not is the work. Protocol, yeah. um, and so it was very strenuous because, you know, I'm a very natural person, so I don't like, you know, ingesting like medications. Like I'm more like a holistic approach type of person. So the fact that they were injecting massive amounts of hormones inside yeah. of me was very very stressful and it was very painful it was um emotionally draining it was mentally um just it was i was all over the place and then i was stressed out of course because you know you want things to work out for the best the hope you know and and you know even on this side of things you know nothing pained me more than to every night have to inject you in the stomach um you know be that you know, emotional and moral support, you know, where I'm just seeing you go through all this. And, you know, as a man, you're like, good Lord, you know, why? Why do we have to go through all this to be able to go, you know, and achieve this goal? And you feel responsible. Um, but you were an absolute trooper. 
you know, you're the strongest thing I've ever met and seen. Women um, are the strongest beings because, you know, it takes one thing to be able to hurt and destroy, but to be able to tolerate is even more so, especially with the poise that you guys do it. Um, so we went through that first egg retrieval, right? And we didn't get the greatest uh, greatest results, you know? We got nothing. We got nothing. I never forget. We're pulling up. We're being optimistic. Um, but, you know, as I see them, you know, the table, the gurney, you know, your robes. Yeah, all put me to sleep like, all these other temporarily. Things. And I'm just like, good Lord, please. And, you know, when he, uh, when I'm in there and you're under anesthesia, recovering from it, you know, with the anesthesiologist. And when um, I woke up, you knew before I did. So I just saw the sadness in you and I knew that we failed. Yeah. Yeah, we did. You know, at that moment, we, we didn't achieve our goal. Um you know, um, the doctor even then, you know, he was still optimistic with his protocol and whatnot. He says, we're going to try again. Um, I will say, though, and, and by no means is this to, you know, um, badger anyone or, you know, come down on anyone. I will say that the next protocol really didn't have that many augmentations, you know, and, and you could touch on that more. We didn't see a lot of changes. It was more like we're just going to do this all over again. Yeah, it was a very subtle change, you know. Yeah, maybe. And what's the like definition of insanity, right? Doing, doing the, the same, same thing, thing over, over and over, over again, again, expecting a different result. And you know, I was concerned, but at the same time, you know, it's you're a doctor. just you're following the doctor, you yeah. know, which I recommend that people really advocate for themselves sometimes yeah. because, well, all the time because you know yourself best. Oh yeah. You know, so that should be a collaboration. Your your medical professional and yourself is a collaboration. Um, and you know, now in hindsight, like I wish that I would have advocated more for myself, but then I realized everything happens for a reason. Oh yeah. And I tell you, even us as professionals, I think that's why we listen to our clients so much because it's very easy for someone to come into the Wotani and be like, Oh, you need an Ebola. Oh, you need this cleaning. Oh, this and that. Let's look into the person's history a little bit. Let's look into their background, their pathology. Let's make sure we are going through all options to be able to give them the best product at the best price point like the other day i was talking with somebody she's like oh i have hand to be fine this and that and i'm ready to crown but as i delve in and i start asking those key questions the woman had nothing done so imagine if i take her through you know said thousands of dollars process and we we and that's ultimately what happened with us we went through these ivfs and then you know something else manifested you know but um respecting the um, opinion of a, a celebrated professional within his community. I mean, he didn't have bad reviews, you know, per se. None that would have deflected us from utilizing his services. Here we go again, right? And and just to go back to, because this is a spiritual channel, right? So yeah. going to the spiritual aspect of it sure. and kind of things that occurred spiritually, right, that kept the faith going. I actually have a family friend who um, is a daughter of Oya. Mm. And... God bless her. And she is amazing. She's been crowned she's for, I think she was, she, I mean, I want to say Real she's good. been crowned for like 40 years or something or almost 40 years, but she's not an old woman. She's she's, she's pretty young. It's just that she um, crowned very young. But Correct. anyway, the point is that she actually only calls me when she gets a message. So yeah, when I see out. that phone ringing with her name and the name, and then it says, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm like, oh, oh. There's a message. Yeah. So she, actually, going back to when we first met, um, she called me when we were about to transition into friendship to, you know, something more. Yeah. She actually completely described you yeah. to a T. She said he looks like this, this, and you know him, and, you know, you guys are going to be very happy together, and you guys are going to have a botanica one day. And, like, all of these things manifested, and, you know, at that time... When she gave me this message, I was very respectful of the message, of course. But I was very much into corporate world. Like, I wasn't thinking about having a botanica. Yeah. You know, I come from the banking corporate industry. So for her to say that, I was like, yeah, I'm going to have a botanica. Okay. You know, and then years later, it starts manifesting, right? But during that message, she also said something else to me. She said, you're going to have a baby with this man. I see the baby. You know, it's a beautiful baby. It's going to be a blessing in your family. And I'm thinking in my head, oh, I think she doesn't know that. I probably have my tubes tied, right? Word. But once again, respecting that spiritual message. Allowing it. Um, and just listening to it, letting it sink in. But I, I want to touch on that because I actually believe so much in this amazing spiritualist that 
and her messages that I actually held on to that. Like for some reason, because this woman told me that, I knew throughout this whole journey that we somehow were going to have a baby. Yeah, I knew it because everything that this woman ever said to me has come to light. No, and apart from that, you know, aside from her being a beast and everything that she's ever said, she even got my, my gray hairs. You know oh, what I'm yeah. And I that mean, was the crazy part about it. She's like, he's an older man. You know what I'm saying? And no, like, she okay. said you were going to be an elder, an elder. in which you yeah. are yeah, because, yeah. you know, because of your position. Yeah, with any faso. And then apart from that, the misas we did and, you know, the muertos coming down and just giving a consistent story of it's going to happen. Yeah, and, and, it, and it actually became frustrating because... You know, I and After each failure. just going into that spiritual, the spiritual aspect of it, and being that we're such spiritual beings, no. right? And we we have people that look up to us and we mentor, and it's like no. we can't fix this problem. No. We can't fix this. You know, we're going through this. Nobody knows we're going through it. No. Um, and it's it really, the faith really really comes in at that point. And you know, every time there would be a misa. A muerto would come down, and sometimes they really wouldn't even touch on it. They really wouldn't no. say anything. And no. then, you know, I, I would kind of wake up and say, well, why am I not getting any messages, you know? And, and that frustration, it has to be said, was there, in, you know, in a sense, because you're kind of like, oh, the fear. you know, well, what can we do? Yeah. You know, how can we make this happen? And it just wasn't happening. Yeah, and sometimes they're even limited. You know, they can't play God, you know? They can say, hey, it's going to happen, but other than that, they can't delve, you know, because... They have to allow things to manifest and not have a butterfly effect where we change our course based on an inkling that they might give, you know. So we go through the second egg retrieval. We have a little bit of a better result, which was. So um, we retrieved one little egg. Yes. Actually, we retrieved two little eggs. Two. And then one survived and then they froze and it was a perfect embryo. Yeah. I mean, it was like picture perfect. Yeah. So they were very optimistic. They, were very promi- they said it was And very for promising. people that are not familiar with IVF, for me to say we got two eggs when the average woman gets seven, nine. Seven to nine, yeah. About nine. To, and, and then some women are just, you know, they're going off. They get 15 to 20, 20 eggs. Yeah. So I got two. Yes. So that's just so you, it's so people out there could understand, you know, what two really means. Yes. You know, it, it's, it really doesn't mean anything good. Yes. But they were really optimistic because of the quality. And so, you know, that really got us going because we're like, you know, this is this going to happen. And we had that hope. And so so we did get that one egg. And so we got prepared for, you know, for the what's the, what's called a transfer where the baby gets put back in. Yeah. And I remember we even got the uh, the shirt, the little embryo that could. Yeah. I'll never forget that, man. And, you know, I would stare at that shirt every time I walked in the closet and, you know. You, you really have a lot of conversations with God, you know what I'm saying? Um, so the day comes, you know, wake up early. Mind you, every time, every other, it was... And a, I don't want to, I don't mean to interrupt you, uh, but I, I mean, also another thing that's really important is to delve into, because in between those two cycles, we did a lot of brujeria. Oh, God. So, I mean, if I don't know if you want to touch on just, I mean, like, we even went back into our itas. Yeah. Our Orisha Itas, like from yeah. 10, 12 yeah. years ago yeah. to try to see what are we going to do, Absolutely. you know. And so I don't know if you want to touch on that because all yeah. of that happened between these processes, well, actually. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, you're looking for everything. So me being as analytical as I am and as studious as I am, I said, whether we achieve this or not, I need to have closure of knowing I did everything I could or was recommended for this. So I went back into my Ita um found things that i and for all the people that are out there whether you're crowned 100 years please go back into your libreta and organize yourself to do the recommendations that came out of your hand by way of the dilogun you know because if not it's not that the consejos that the brother oriate gives you aren't coherent but no one is above orisha right so whatever comes out under all those numbers and letters and adimus and whatever it may be Please do, because I think it had a significant effect ultimately when we did succeed. You know, it came out simple things. I had to put a pumpkin with honey to a shoon, which represents the womb, right? I ended up having to give a goat to a goon, represents the surgeon and the OBGYN. Um, all of these things. I had to make sure I completed and paid homage to my godmother's guardian angel, which yes, is Yamaya. Ma'am. I had not thrown a tambon. After all these years, because it's 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 a financial strain, and oh, yeah. so, but I was, you know, thank goodness, in a position that yeah. I was able to do that for my godmother and her guardian angel, and 
you know, I think that made an impact too because we threw the tambor to Yemaya. And even even more frustrating was Yemaya spoke of the baby. You know, with the Odu that was revealed and the Odu that was revealed was Irosung Meji. I'll never forget. And, um, yeah, because I had a conversation with Yamaya. We brought down her caracol. Down. We did it right. We mm-hmm. did it right. Let's bring down Madrino's caracol. Let's see what Yamaya wants. And what did Yamaya want? She wanted two candles and two coconuts. You know, so when you see... To things, the point where the Oriate was like... It was baffled. Well, what do you mean? It's been 10 years. You know, you have to owe something else. And he, we were kind of kept asking. And she's like, no, this is all I need. I just need some coconuts. So that provided us a lot of reassurance beforehand. So when we go into the transfer... Um, and mind you, we were driving to Maitland every morning from, uh, from Meadowwoods. You know, that's an hour some odd drive. You know, we're waking up, you know, super early, you know, after working. At that point, we were working 12-hour days, 16-hour days. We were working seven days, days a week because the Botanica was open we seven were days a week. starting. So we go, you know, um, and we're in there. We're in the room. They take us to the back. Um, Probably one of the most depressing scenarios I've ever been in, you know, because I I tell you a hospital or a doctor's office in itself can be depressing. But, you know, when you're in the inner inner sanctums, I guess, and, you know, it's just a bunch of gray and you're seeing a bunch of instruments and whatnot. You're like, man, there's just it's, it's very empty, you know, so they lay you down. Once again, you know, all the instruments and, you know, mechanisms, you know, the spreading of things and whatnot. The doctor comes in. And I'll never forget, you, like, record. And he's showing us on the screen where, you know, insertion's going to happen, et cetera. Um, I'll never forget, the doctor had to say, like, two or three times for them to give him the egg. You know, so I'm like, all right, well, that that, that was a little bit of a mishap. And then when he actually, you know, lets it in, um, you know, you see the burst on the screen. And you're like, okay, this is creation, you know. And um, that was it. You know, I was tearing. Um, you were tearing. We were optimistic, but ironically, me being the way I am with technology, I wasn't actually recording anything. <laughs> I'll never forget. I'm I'm over here like this. I'm like, yes, yes, yes. This is a memory, and then the recording never actually happened. You know, I don't know if I had too much on my phone or I'm just a klutz, but at that moment, it was such a letdown. But once again, this inner feeling was like, you weren't meant to record that, and I'm like, dude. You know, this voice, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm having arguments with it. Like, what do you mean? I just messed up. So we continue, right? We go about our life for the next two weeks, you know. Um, I'll never forget, there was a trip to Walmart um, when you were like, hey, babe, I think I'm feeling something, you know. And I really felt like, you know, we're in there, you know. So the day comes. And I'll give that to you to kind of kick off how, how the process of that day went. Well, I mean, um, so we, I didn't do, so some women that go through the IVF, they take home pregnancy tests, Correct. but you didn't let me do that. No, you know, no, no. you, you kind of were, you said, don't do it. Cause you didn't want me to deal with the yeah, stress. No. So when we got there, I really didn't know what to expect. And they went ahead and took my blood and they were supposed to get back to me within a few hours to tell me that, you know, I was pregnant. Right. Yes, ma'am. Um, but one thing that I remember, I needed, um, medication to continue some medication. Right. And, um, This was the first sign that something was wrong. Um, The nurse actually called me back and she said, oh, we put a stop on the medication. Yeah. And I said, so what does that mean? Does that mean we're not pregnant? And she said, no, that's not what that means. The doctor will call you later. Yeah. And so we just waited on that call. Yeah. And we did. And um, I think we were supposed to receive something by noon. Right. You know, but as soon as we left, you know, it was already ominous. Mm hmm. And then, you know, on the drive home, then we're home, then noon creeps around, one o'clock creeps around, 2 p.m., 2.30, you give a call. What's going on? Oh, well, doctor will be in touch with you. You should be getting your results soon. Babe, we're not pregnant. Yeah, we are, babe. We're pregnant. Everything's fine. You know how this works. You know, they can't, they can't officially say we're pregnant. You know, this is just me looking for options, you know. 3.30. 4.30. By this point, we're agonizing on the couch. We're just looking at each other. I can't even look at you. 5.30. We've been checking the email every 20 minutes. 6 p.m. We get an email from Quest Diagnostics, right? Babe, what do you want to do? You want to open it or you want to wait for this guy? Let's wait for the guy. 6.15, 6.22. By 7, we're opening it. I'm like, no. You're like, yes. 
I'm like, all right. We go into the room. We're sitting on our famous chair. And you start opening Quest. And we're having issues logging in. You know, we're not passwords, whatever. We're finally in. There's the result. You know. One, two, three. It's negative. It was negative. And you know me, I'm looking at numbers. And that was like our, for me, it's like, wow, this was the last chance. Like, you know, we did two cycles. I mean, that's it. It's over with. And I remember I'm looking at the numbers. I'm trying to dispute you. I'm like, no, we're not reading it right. You know, this, that, and the third. And we're Googling things. And, you know, it's it's letting it very, let it be known very clear. Um, We didn't succeed. And um, I remember you crying. I remember I just, it was horrible. It was really horrible. Not only the negative result, but just the way we were mishandled, which we'll get into now. And I remember after holding you and just realizing you needed your space, which was the most painful thing for me, I said I need to go and be around my people. I went into the garage. I sat in front of the prenda. And I don't know why I sat in front of him specifically, because I kind of felt like he was the one who had been talking to me all these months. And I just cried. I didn't get angry. You know, I wanted to say a bunch of profanity. You know, the first response is, you know, you want to curse God. and Yeah, I mean, as human beings, we want to lose faith at that moment, you and know, but but we didn't. We didn't. We, we stayed. I cried it out. You know, and, and when I cried, I did cry. Oh, and yeah. I did cry in front of my Oshun, which I, yeah. I, I don't, I've always said this, I really don't go to Oshun, but, but I go to her to cry because she's my mother. Word. Word. She's going to hug me when I'm sad. Word. And it's not that I was asking her to solve it or, you know, proclaiming or asking her why she didn't give me a child but it was more like i'm so sad right now i need my mother Y'all have, and yeah. i cried and i cried and i think at that moment the, the important things to touch on on the spiritual side of it is just understanding that you have to you have to let go at a certain point right so you have to just give in to your faith and at that point i just said i i don't know why this is happening but it is but I know what's happening for a reason. I don't know why, and you know, and it, it just as human beings, it's it's hard to really wrap your head around that. Yeah. But when it comes to your spirituality, those are the moments where the tests are going to be much harder, and your character in those moments are going to be so essential yeah. to how you're going to be able to progress in the future. You know, and and I just I remember just saying, Oh, Shun, you know, I don't know why this is happening, but I know that it's happening for a reason. And all I ask for is the strength to get through all the pain that we're going through. And I remember those conversations, the uncomfortable ones. And I remember the first thing I made sure you knew is I was going nowhere. And that was a very telling time for our relationship yeah. because that really made our relationship so much more stronger. Because oh, when you think about a relationship, it's, um, you know, you think of the theory, it's a give or take. Yeah. Right. I'm with someone because they can provide me with something. Yeah. Whatever that might be, it's like a contract, just like anything else. But you realize at that moment that I realized that you weren't with me necessarily because I could provide you with a child maybe in the future. I could provide you with anything other than my love. And and that's all you wanted. And all I wanted was your love. So um, that really, really, really made our relationship stronger going through that process and realizing that no matter what happens, at least we tried. We yeah. didn't give up. We yeah. maintain faith, and but there has to be a level of um, acceptance. Acceptance. Yeah, and that's. I accept that I've done everything that I can, um, and this is the outcome. And there is a bigger picture that I can't see right now, you know. And I just have to follow that, and and that's where we were at at that moment. Yeah, I remember there was nothing to give and nothing to take. You know, it just it was what it was. And at that moment, you know, I realized um, you had given me three beautiful children even before we were together. Um, I was such a, a player in their life and a role in that home and so in love with you. I said, you know, this is what God wants. But once again, I don't know what this voice is. Something said it's not over. And at that point, I think I'm losing my mind, you know, because I'm like, dude, you know, throw it in. You know what I'm saying? And I remember those next two weeks, it was some of the most blissful time because not because we had just failed, but it was like it was relief. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, we're not expecting anything. My wife is not getting poked with anything. Like, I just, we're, we're, we're going out. 
We're doing things, we're just trying to get our mind off of it. And nonsense. it was Christmas time. It was Christmas time. We, we failed the second time in December, so we had to go through Christmas with smiles Yo, on our face man. and Nobody New Year's, knowing nothing. and no one knew. Dude, and um, when that New Year came in, um, I'll never forget, we read we read each other. It was other. time to, yeah, get the readings of the read. year and, and see what was going on for the new year. And I'll never this forget. This was 2021. Okay. Right? Yeah, because okay. the baby was born in 2022. This was, so this was 2021. Word. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I read you. I read myself first and foremost. I came with Ida de Yero. You know what I'm saying? And then that sign was where the peacock laid an egg. You know, and the peacock and the vulture are one and the same, and we're both children of Ecole. And I'm like, man, stop. Just stop playing with me, you know? And, um... Then I read you, and you came with Ayobe. And I was like, good Lord, man, what does this even mean? You know what I'm saying? So I'll never forget. I don't know what it is about the botanica or the tree in the back of the botanica. I don't know, but I, you know, sometimes, you know, when I'm in between or, you know, it's just a light day and the girls are handling the front, I sit back there and I spark up a, a nice stogie. And I was like, I was sitting there, and I was just meditating, you know, and I don't know what it is about my muerto. He comes, and he said have her pull the results again and i said you gotta be kidding me man i can't talk to you no more you're just ridiculous you know and i, I felt embarrassed even mentioning it to you again you know but ironically even that was on your mind you know so what was that process like when we started uh pondering? Well, you mentioned it and i was already thinking it yeah you know yeah. it's like i because i it. knew i wasn't ready to give up you know there was something in me that just said keep going yeah. and um and again, just thinking about all the messages I received and just in misas and just, you know, just holding on to that faith. Like, I believe in my things. Yeah. My things are not going to tell me lies. We're going to have a baby. Word. And um, it ironically, I call. I get this woman on the phone. <laughs> that I don't know who this woman is, yeah. but she's, I don't know why she was so eager to help me. But she must have been an angel right. because as soon as I got on the phone, she said, I'm going to have I, I can pull up your results. I, there's a way that I can do it. I can pull up your your when we say results, what we were looking into at that point is my tubal ligation. My operative report. My operative report. Yeah. And um, she, she said, I can have it to you. This woman had it to me in my email. Within an hour. You know, she connected with the hospital. And I don't know. She just, And then I also got the results in the mail. So when we opened those results, I realized something very important. I realized that my tubes weren't burnt. I actually had them fully intact, only had a clamp on them. The fal What are they, the Fauci clamps? Or the the, the Filchi clamp? clips. The, the Filchi So I just had them clipped, the which I couldn't even believe oh, in. <laughs> you, see, you have the FBI knocking on the door. I couldn't believe it. And... Um, I had already at that point looked into what were the f most successful forms of reversals, and actually that's the number one. That was it, and what you had actually smelled in the operating room was their sutures, because I came to that conclusion when the baby was born after the C-section, they burn you shut now. They're yeah. not sewing you, so that's what you smell, and then when you're under all that medication, you're like, oh my God, they're burning me alive, you know? So this was now another adventure, right? And um, we have the information now, you're doing your research, we have the simplest form of tube ligation the most highly reversible um and you start doing what you do you start delving you start infiltrating and um you come across a gentleman well first and foremost what you realize is that ivf is something that's just so prominent now no one does anything else because of the high dollar value and then just that's what's taught but then there's the tube ligation reversal exactly which is really a pariah yeah people don't really talk about it no you know, they're or they you know, they feel like maybe it's fake or it's not real, you yeah. know, and, and it's just crazy. And there was a few things that happened I want to touch on because when I was doing my investigating on, you know, who because now, you know, I want to make sure we get the best doctor. Yeah, we don't I mean, I repeat. looked into you don't even understand how deep I delved yeah. into their medical even their medical licenses, make sure there was no malpractice, make sure there were no complaints. I mean, I was all over the place. But the one thing that I found was that there are some doctors within this field that they actually will not perform this surgery if they believe they will not have success. Yeah. Now, what will make them believe you they're not going to have success? Your fertility reports, yeah. which mine, as we said, were not good. Yeah. So there were some doctors that weren't even an option So because they, they go by that criteria. Yeah. But there was this one doctor oh. that I actually accessed. Um, he actually, I found him through a blog. 
Oh, I love that. Man. And he was talking about AMH. Now we're not medical professionals, but if any if there's any people going through this, it's important to understand you know that what those three letters AMH mean. really those numbers are really just telling the fertility doctors how successful you could possibly be during an IVF cycle. Meaning, how is your body going to react to all these medications they're about to inject in you? Very isolated. They use these numbers to say, are, is your body going to react well? Meaning, we're going to get a lot of eggs, or is your body not going to react so well? So we're not going to get a lot of eggs. Therefore possibly not having success, right? Yeah. But there's a lot of women out there that are believing that they're infertile because they have certain numbers, and then they have this in their head, I'm infertile, then they're getting all these fertility treatments that they may or may not need. They're going through the wrong and testing. And that's important to be said. They're going through the wrong testing, you know, because at the end of the day, um, the gentleman that we ended up going with, and we'll mention him now, he made it very clear. That means nothing. You have an egg, you have a regular menses, you can get pregnant. It only takes one in one. That's exactly. the thing, you know what I'm saying? So, um, and, and also my age was I was still fairly young. At this point, I'm 37. You're not even 40. And that's so. another thing as well, ladies. Um, high risk, right? Oh, don't have a baby after 35. I'm not a conspiracy guy, but there is this thing called population control and collapse, right? And we're seeing it now. My grandmother had my mother, her youngest child, I believe at like 37. This was back in the 70s. They were still moving forward. They weren't saying terminate a pregnancy. They weren't saying we got to cut you in half. They were like, let's move forward. You know, there's one thing in literature and propaganda, and there's another thing in that operating room. So don't be afraid, especially now. If my grandmother wasn't worried, and she did it naturally 30, 50 years ago. There's, with the advances, you have nothing to worry about. So. I mean, women women have shown to be fertile well into their 40s. Ifa says a woman can bear a child up until 50. You know, Popola has that in his book, Ikunle Abiyamo, which is one I definitely recommend and read and help support me through um, this process. You know what I'm saying? And, and we're going to touch on the points that Popola had to play as we move forward, which I touched on in his interview. You made a huge saying. impact. I love that, man. I mean, that, that that they will never, no one will ever hear anything negatively said about Baha Popola or anybody in that camp ever here because it's it wouldn't be correct because it was by way of that information, I think, the deciding factor was played in our achievement of this goal. So may Allah Dumari bless him and his camp wherever they are. Um, so you find a guy, you know, and I'm going to mentor him, Dr. Charles Monteith. What is he? He's in Raleigh or Greensboro? He's in Raleigh, North Carolina. Raleigh, North Carolina. A, a, another huge amount of love for this man. And we started binging his blogs. We started binging his videos. Um, and, and his team was, re they were very responsive. They amazing. immediately called me and they said, oh, you're, we could do this. You're prime. And, you know, family guy, family operated. You know, his wife's involved. You know, you look at... The practice that he actually took over had a history and a track record of success where people from all over the world are going to this man to be able to conceive. Apart from that, since he's been able to take over, huge success rates as well. And out of nowhere, um, he explains his process, which if I remember was, we have to, you know, he has to do minimally invasive, um, you know, a procedure to see what's going on in there and then to decide whether he can move forward right then and there. So just like that, we're planning a trip to North Carolina. Yeah. Thousands of dollars more. Yeah, you but know? it was much more affordable than the IVF. Absolutely. And um, much less stressful. Um, you know, and, and just like that, we're riding through Lynchburg, South Carolina. Yeah, to and get it there. was very, it was so simple. It was an outpatient. Yeah. I just went in. I, they did put me under anesthesia when I woke up. My tubes were open. He showed us the clips. He showed the us the clips. He said, go ahead, go home, get heal for a few weeks, and try to, to have a baby. Yeah, so um, here we go, you know. And he made it so simple. It was like, it was a, it we, was... we just couldn't believe it. We're like, and, and to the point where um, when I went back for my follow-up, he was a little annoyed by me because I said, so what you're saying is my tubes are open and yeah. I can have a baby. And he's, he's like, like, yeah. Would you give me all these thousands of dollars? Yeah, for he's like, Tommy he, Tuck? yeah, he's like, well, <laughs> you know, go have a baby. Yeah, that's what you paid me for. So, I mean... He was very honest and to the point. I love that, he was man. no yeah. nonsense, but he was Amazing. very simple and he didn't complicate things. And Amazing. I think that really helped us, especially being where we were at, uh, having gone through so much failure and so much uh, misguidance at that point. Um, it was really refreshing. I felt with him the way I feel like some people feel with us after they've been through the ringer and they've been mishandled. And then, you know, some people actually get, you know, a little startled with us. Like, yeah, it's. 
oh there goes she, there she goes you know it's um it's just as simple hey this that and the third and they're actually like then they doubt us the same way we even doubted him to a certain yeah, degree. Yeah, we kind of so, believe it. We're so traumatized from the overcomplication of things between needles and injections and months. I fell asleep during your procedure. You know, they had to wake me up like she's ready for you. As embarrassing as that is, I was that confident in that man where I was able to rest, you know. So after that, we had home, you know. And, and there was a, and, and another thing, there was a lot of holistic care that I was also seeking oh, yeah. through Chinese medicine. Yeah, Dr. Ling over here on Gatling. Yeah, Gatling's I world. had acupuncture. I yeah. would do acupuncture to help with my blood flow. I was taking herbs, natural remedies to kind of help with my hormones and making sure we were producing quality. Um, so it was a lot that really went into it. Yeah, it's a lot of work having a baby. And spiritually, it was a lot. Because oh, at God. that point, I mean, we just did so much brujeria. Like, we don't, <laughs> I mean, it was crazy. The heads were rolling. You know, heads uh, were rolling, like real. literally, you know, so we come home, um, you heal up and then we get to work. Right. Um, you know, I think they told us, you know, it's very normal to not conceive within that year. Right. But at the same time, the clock is ticking. So, you know, there's always that pressure. There's always that uh, that's f that fear. And then we also have the ovulation calendar. Right. Um, for all the gentlemen out there that know what the ovulation calendar is, God bless you. Um, God bless all the people that have been through this process. As much in love with your wife as you may be, there is nothing more stressful than respecting the ovulation window. Um, and I tell you, because not only are we trying to maximize these opportunities, we're trying to make sure we're doing as much as we can. Um, month one goes by. Month two. Month three. And you know, the stress is building. The stress is building because, you know, we're thinking every month, you know, it goes down, it goes down, it goes down. Um, and then we had a couple faithful encounters. I think we can minimize the conception down to two encounters, you know, um, two very specific places that we won't mention here. Um, and then out of nowhere, you give me. But might have been in the store. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Nothing but spirituality happens in this botanica. <laughs> and, um. You know, out of nowhere, you uh, you give me a call. Um, but even before then, how about that? Before we even jump into that, let's delve into Popola's role. Um, we're looking for a boss. We're looking for options. We're looking for things. I'm doing it at a month from your sign. I said we're going into Arita. We're doing everything, everything. in Arita. Everything. And at this point, I, I lean out of our practice and I delve into Ishesha a little bit. You know, and I'm looking at the Fadida. Um, and I'm looking through your Odu because... The information in there is incredible. And it's literally every pataki of Obet Rupong in that od in that book is about fertility and procreation. And I find the Ebo that blew my mind. You know, it talked about our situation, the failure, the finding of the soulmate, you know, the, the frustration, the families, all the things that we overcame. You know, and we heard all these negative things that people, you know, were suspecting. Um, and we do the Ebo with the goat to your Ifa. And it said, the woman will get pregnant next month. It was guaranteed. It guaranteed. says it in the book. It guaranteed. is guaranteed. 100% guaranteed. It does not matter. This woman will conceive. You know me, I'm thinking the worst. I'm thinking ectopic. I'm thinking, you know, because there's so many ways to interpret that, right? Um, but we do it. You leave the heart on top. We give the, the, the she-goat. And um, that ne next month you gave me a call what was that day like you know what was that moment like well let's talk about sp the spiritual aspect of it once again yeah i host a misa oh god and yeah. somebody very special to me yeah. we actually interviewed recently yo shout out to sheena the Agayu sheena. episode yeah for sure man, god Omo bless her, man. amazing Epiritita. amazing she sister, comes man. into trance amazing and her spirit looks at me and just taps her belly and just says like you're having a baby in front of everybody and everybody was like stupefied like no one even understood her other than me and you I, i'll never forget that misa because i was sitting like to her side because i'm always outside the circle and then you were looking right at her you know and i was like got emotional in that moment but i believed so much in egun i knew it was real and i actually wasn't even due for my menses and the next day after that misa i took a test yeah and it was positive yeah, and there's just that feeling of seeing so many negative results. I mean, I can't even describe what it is to see a positive. It's it's nothing short of a miracle, like literally. I'll never forget you called me. Where are you? I'm like, I'm at work, you know, stay there. 
all right, I'm here. <laughs> you know, you pull up screeching in the van. You come out crying. I thought somebody had died, you know, and then you, you shove the, the test in my face and, you know, we're pregnant, y'all. I'll never forget that moment. I'll never forget that moment because it was so unreal. And then even with all of the elation of the positive result, I'm immediately thinking about the negative. I'm like, oh, my God, is it real? Is it not real? Is it going to stick? You know, just trying to be in the moment and appreciate that victory, you know. Um, and I'll never forget, I, I, I literally, when you left, I stood in the back, you know, tears running down my face. And I looked at the sky and I just said, thank you. There was some profanity in there too. You know, the people in the back were like, oh my God, he's lost his mind. But, um, you know, oh my God, just like that, we're pregnant. And even then, um, more obstacles, you know. Um, with the tube reversal, there's always the chance for the ectopic pregnancy. Um, once again, just being met with adversity, you know. Um, those initial doctor's appointments where they're like, you know, um, it's and mind you, we were testing early to make sure you weren't ectopic. Um, we're not seeing anything. Yeah. So that I mean, we got that first appointment. They said, "Oh well, there's nothing there." Like, what do you mean? There's nothing there? Yeah. No, there's no baby in there. And I'm seeing the squiggly. That's the there, crazy thing. There's is. nothing in there. I'm like, okay. And then after all this, and you know, there's nothing here. Yeah. yeah so no. we started getting. We went through a whole other challenge in well, the yeah, beginning of the pregnancy. I'll bring up. I'll bring up the topics that most jump out to me is one, ladies. And gentlemen, a, a physician is to be respected. I'm the son of one. I'm the nephew of one. I have many doctors in my family. It's never to discredit their preparation. These people are they, they are saviors and, and pres preservers of life. But you have to take things through their process, right? You have to be patient because I'll never forget I was working and you had an appointment. And you were experiencing something that I'm going to say now because I've actually had some cases where I've been able to alert people about the existence of this concept, the chorionic hemorrhage, which occurs when an egg is released. There's a little explosion that happens to release it so that it can, you know, meet the sperm, implant, all of these different things. It's going to cause some spotting, you know. It can cause heavy bleeding. Heavy bleeding, you know. It can so cause even like blood clotting to where you might think you passed a baby or you're not, having a miscarriage. Yeah, we are not miscarrying possibly. So with all of these symptoms that you had, um, with the sonogram not showing what they were looking for, being that and they were looking that too point, early. And at that point, we were further along and they were looking for a heartbeat. At that point, weeks, could not find a heartbeat at seven, seven weeks. weeks. For those of you that don't know, by seven weeks, you should be getting a heartbeat. Ideally. We were not getting a heartbeat on the baby, and I was bleeding. So yeah. they said, it's over they let us know you are having a miscarriage, and we're going to go ahead and provide you with an injection that's going to pass this baby. Gotcha. And I said, no. Yeah, absolutely not. I'll never forget when we ran into that doctor, he wouldn't look me in the face. I wanted to kill that guy, you know, um, because let things take its course. You know what I'm saying? If it is that, let it be that. But don't play God. You know what I'm saying? And um, the reason we couldn't see the baby is because your physiology. The baby was all the way on top. She was hiding. And that's what she so does we, now. So they couldn't see her. and But the baby was there. And the baby did have a heartbeat. And if I would have done what I was instructed to do that day, God forbid, she wouldn't be here. Or, After you know. everything that we went through, um, then we still were going through that pain of, you know, that early pregnancy. And it, we had a lot of scares. Yeah. And I was like, not again. And I'll never forget when that nurse came in. God bless him. You know, he's like, hey, baby looks great. There's a baby in there. Heartbeats like this. And we were just taken aback. We're like, oh, my God. Once, you know, this roller coaster. Um, oh, and by the way, um, during this process, when even before this doctor wanted to inject me, I already diagnosed myself because I actually looked at my own medical reports Google. and I was able to see that I had the hemorrhage. Shout out and to I was Google. able to understand that I was actually bleeding, not because I was having a miscarriage. It, it, what it's called, it's known as a missed miscarriage. So... People interpret it as a miscarriage, but it doesn't necessarily have to be one. Yeah. And so I already knew that for myself before I went in here. So once again, advocating for yourself, do your research, look at your own reports. Not that you're going to diagnose yourself. We wouldn't recommend that. But you need to make educated decisions. And we yourself. learned that during yeah. this process. Because unfortunately, like in most industries, not all professionals are the same. You look at someone like Dr. Monteith, um, high volume. But he has such an amazing operation. He doesn't get flustered because when you get flustered, you start moving through things like a factory, right? 
cannot do this because a life gets lost in context. You know, unfortunately, said physician um, was like, yeah, let's just get this over with because he's probably not in the position other people are. And how many people has he? Ten people. Possibly told that to. Maybe he hates his job. Maybe he hates his life. Whatever it may be. These are all the things you have to take into account because whether it's a babalawo, an olorisha, a doctor, a lawyer, a president, these are human beings. And you don't know this. You still situation. have to utilize your logic, Always. even with an ifa and orisha Always. logic. Always. You know that that still has to be put into place. We just can't do things blindly. No, and and just like that, we're pregnant. You know, still in secret, still in silence. I forgot how long we waited to reveal it. We waited a little bit. Um, you know, the cocoa butter was in full effect. Cravings were in full effect. I'm going through the best emotions of my life. I'm up at two in the morning getting food. You know, uh, preparing, learning. Um, pregnancy was a great teacher. And, you know, to all those men out there that are supporting women going through these processes, whether it's a failed IVF, whether it's a scary um, neo pregnancy, be that support system, gentlemen. Understand it's not personal, it's not with you. Estrogen is a real thing. Pre partum depression, postpartum depression, these are real things, but they can be mitigated by patients education and understanding you know um and understand you have to accept your feelings as well you know as a man because the estrogen will do things to you i was watching this great clip um it talks about i think prolactin how it the estrogen has an effect on the male testosterone going down and the stores of fat growing to be able to prepare because you'll become less of the focus so you eat less it's like this is all based on evolution you know so um no scares during pregnancy at that point. I mean, she, um, what is it called? She was, uh, what is it when they, they point the stomach? You know, the, the scary thing. The contractions. The contractions, yeah. you know. We had a great um, experience with those people who did the sonogram photos. Found out we were having a girl. You know, I, I, I mean, that's a whole nother episode in itself. Just those emotions um, and what it does to the, the male and fatherly mind. Um, you know, one thing I really want to touch on is, you know, the sign you came with that year. You know, you came with Okana Sode, and you're a daughter of Shango by way of your father. Because this is already a new year now. We're, We're already here. I pulled a new one. Um, I came with Iroso to Alara, you know what I'm saying, where Obatala protected his daughter. Um, and you came with Okana Sode, where Shango protected his child, you know. And, and um, I'm a child of Shango as yeah, well. He's exactly, my father exactly. in Orisha. So, you know, in that sign was where the child was afraid of thunder and lightning. You know, he had a phobia of it. And Shango made him overcome his fears and come outside when it was thundering and lightning. So he would receive the blessing. So the night before birth is happening, right? And ironically, the birthday, without us planning it, gets scheduled by the doctor. Or the cesarean gets scheduled by the doctor on the same day your father passed. Yes, baby is born the same day of my father's passing. It doesn't, it doesn't get any more epic or divine. And we even said, if you want to change it, you can. She said, well, maybe, you know, this day. And then last minute, she's like, no, it's going to be this day. Okay, here we go. You know, just, just that much more comfort and confirmation. The night before, we're getting bags ready. I'm nervous. You know, I'm trying to cook, you know, make sure everything's prepared. I'm thinking I'm going to get a full night's rest. We're going to wake up nice and early because they want us there at 4 in the morning. And... uh we're going to have a baby tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? That didn't happen. What happened? What happened was Shango started talking. He started playing the drum, yo. The worst thunderstorm Natural. that I have heard Torrential since my rain. son was crowned Shango, what, seven years before that, that it was thundering, and, and it was just like you can feel it in your bones. You know, when the thunder just hits and you're feeling it, and I actually went into labor. Yeah, and I was like... Everything's going to be just fine. We and was, I was freaking out, just like the sign said. Yeah, I was scared. Phobia. And then you reminded me. You said, no, Shango is telling you you're going to be okay. Everything's going to be fine. But I tell you, all the way up until the actual birth, it didn't seem like things were going to be okay. We're, we're, we're in the car. I'm rocking down Orange Avenue. Pull up to Winnie Palmer. Thank God we're here. No accidents. You know, we get in. Um, we had amazing physicians. I would love to find out who the other physician on there with Ford Kelly was because that man was amazing. Nurses were good. We were having a little mishap with the veins, but that's normal with you, you mm -hmm. know, um, based on your physiology. I think you went in at uh, 6 a.m., 6 or 5. They started dressing me up at like 6.18. 
And just like that, she was born at 626, 628, you know. And just like that, we had a baby. Just like that, we had a baby, you know. It's so important. Um, uh, we thought it was important to have this conversation because I yeah. think when people look at spiritual beings, spiritual leaders, mentors, what have you, you know, we're not God. No, um, we're just in we the go middle. through life and we're going through situations just like everyone else is. But it's all about how you handle those situations. It's all about how you react and your character during those hard times is really going to dictate how you're going to enjoy those wonderful times. Yeah, we're And I think we're them. a testament of that, of showing good character even in the hardest times of our lives without people even knowing that we were going through it. And yeah. still... You know, I was still crowning Orishas. I was still yo, going through my room, whole yo. processes, mentoring. Room, you know, and no one knew. Where people so it's important to have this conversation. You know, I was trying not to let one go. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, the reactions. I mean, some people were very happy. Some people were indifferent. Some people were not happy. Um, you know, you begin to realize who's with you and who loves you when you're going through your worst and best times. You know when people saying? see that outside perspective. They don't see the pain. No, they don't. And it's important for people to understand when you see someone happy or successful in whatever it is they have achieved. Pain. Don't it's allow pain. envy to come in because understand that everybody has sacrificed to obtain the things that they have. Yeah. And the pain is there. Yeah. It's always pain behind behind those those triumphs. And we definitely experienced that. And just to touch on uh, really quickly um, how things, once again, make full circles. Um, my baby was born the day my father passed. But just to delve deeper into that, and the reason why that's so important is because when my father passed away, I actually was one of the first people that knew intuitively that he wasn't going to survive. And... I've always asked spirit not to tell me those things because the things we can't change, I don't need to know. Yeah. But in that case, I knew. And um, I actually had a dream 18 months before he passed away that he was going to pass away in 18 months. The spirits let me know. And um, they showed me a vision of my father waiting for me when he was going to pass. And everyone was waiting for me to show up. And when I showed up, he actually passed away in my arms. <laughs> and um, that is actually what happened. My father passed away in my arms. Um, it was the worst day of my life. Um, I don't want to get emotional, but yeah. it was the worst day of my life. And I've always said that after he passed away. And um, the fact that he gave me that gift and what was the worst day of my life became one of the best days of my life because we had our daughter. I was going to, if it was a boy, I was going to give him his name. You know what I'm saying? I was going to give him Robert. You know what I'm saying? But he didn't want to come back. So he's good. You yeah, know? no. But I mean, just the role he played, you know, us really getting to know each other in a ceremony that was dedicated to him, um, him giving those messages, you know, the baby being born on the day he passed, giving us a reason to celebrate. Um, may he rest. May my grandmother rest. May all of the ancestors rest and just thank them for facilitating, you know, because to be able to bring a life into this world, we don't realize how monumental it is even though there's eight billion of us those are eight billion monumental moments against evil against tyranny eight billion uh, miracles eight million eight billion miracles because when you actually go through it and you're in that room nothing for nothing i mean without you know divulging too much there's not much difference between an operating room and the room of ifar odisha it's heaven you know what i'm saying and everything's in there you know you just have to know how to maneuver it to be able to accomplish what it is that you want, you know. Um, a couple of things, you know, I want to get into a moment of gratitude. You know, I mean, obviously your father, um, people I'd like to thank, um, you know, obviously you, you know, um, for believing in a guy that was living in his grandmother's back room. Um, you know, you know, thanks to you, um, the people that gave me life, um, the gentleman that taught me Ifa, my godfather, my uncle, my, my good friends, um, to Baba Bobola as well for his information and his uh, messiahic work within Ifa that provided a very defining piece of literature. Um, the doctors, the physicians, our children, uh, the family members and friends that have stood by us. Um, the baby's actually laughing in the background. That's so funny. The baby. She's cracking up. You know, we won't sleep tonight. Um, 
you know, that's just all my gratitude, all my gratitude, you know, because it's the most humbling experience. You know, you've given me the greatest gift um, even before, you know, she got here, you know, with the other three. And then allowing me to go through that, you know, neonatal phase um, and just feeling that uh, the divine rush of emotion, you know, and helping me, you know, and my children for preparing me for what's to come already. You know what I'm saying? So I'm not sure if there's anybody else you'd like to, you know, express I, that I just want to thank you for all your uh, love and support. Yeah. And just everything that we've been through has brought us to where we are today. Yeah. And we're just very thankful. And we're thankful to all of the Orishas to Orumila, um, to all of our spirit guides, the everyone public, that is with us, yeah, um, family, viewers. you know, all of the support that we had, even though a lot of people, well, no one knew what we were going through. No. But, you know, just the support is still there, yeah. you know, and we really appreciate that. And, you know, um, yeah, anybody who is out there who is going through this, hope. we hope this conversation can hope. help. It might be a different situation might be similar it might be something totally different maybe it's not fertility maybe it's something else you're struggling with maybe it's health maybe it's an illness um you know maybe it's it's anything else but you know anyone who is initiated you know i would like to say that you know look into your ita look into your elders when you're going through situations lean on your orishas and definitely lean on ifa because that is your spiritual dna and it never fails and and you know it's just I I just I, I I don't like the misconceptions that are out there. I just understanding the importance of Ifa and Orumila. Like that is your DNA. Like it never fails when you go back there. Orumila is gonna give you the answer. He's gonna give you the result, the answer, the explanation. And that's why, you know, it is so important. And we lift it. Where would we be? You know? Orula is the Alpha and the Omega. He's there when you start, he's there when you end. And um to not take him along for the ride is to never get started. Yeah. I, I just don't understand the 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 disconnect, right? And within our community between Ifa and Orisha. Ifa is Orisha. Yeah. Orisha is Orula's Ifa. A, Orula's it an is Orisha. One. It is not two separate things. It is one. Ifa is the practice. And so, you know, it's just it's so important. And I, I just I I'm a living testament of that, of the yes. importance of Orumila and his consejo and the things that he is going to provide us with is nothing but knowledge and knowledge is power at the end of the day and freedom you know um lots of hope to you guys to everybody that watched this uh we gave you a lot you know but i'm happy because and it wasn't so much for us to say wow we did it it was just to let let go of it you know and be like this is what occurred you know, even for us, it's a very healing process. Just to we wanted to have the it. conversation because we just kind of popped up with a baby one day, and we're, everybody's we're, like, we're, it was like, "Yo, what, what just what happened? happened? You guys had you a baby." Know, so we're talking about five years of a five-year process. You know, five going on six years now as we're raising her, and um, all we wanted to do is provide hope because at some moment, you know, someone did for us. Whether it's these guys on the wall, or you know, a random person, a random wedto, you know, it, you can achieve. You know what I'm saying? And if we can, I, I don't see why anybody can't, you know what I'm saying, in the right situation. And so. when you are going through pain and suffering, still have faith. Oh, yeah. Have faith and show good character. Because they have faith in you. You know what I'm saying? You know, those tears are powerful. Um, when they're legitimate and they're real and they're, they're well-placed, man, it, it'll move a mountain, you know what I'm saying? And, um, I mean, if you have nothing else, all I have to say is I love you and what an amazing love conversation. And uh, here we go as we uh, as we proceed. You know, family. Whoa, a couple things uh, I want to go ahead and delve into before we go ahead and disconnect. Botanica Candles and More dot com is up and running. Mentorships, consultations, uh, you know, products, etc. Um, apart from that, this podcast is present on all major platforms. Please subscribe, like, comment, share. From Poroye, me, and Our Roots Podcast, thank you. And until next time, see the light. <laughs>